Today's discussion will be presented in three sections since we were recording it for broadcast on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM. You're welcome to post questions and comments during the session and we'll try to answer them online. I'd like to introduce our moderator, Tom Temin, host of Federal Drive on Federal News Radio. Welcome and thanks for joining us. My guests today are Doug Averill, the Global Government Business Line Leader at PEGA. Joe Paiva is the Chief Information Officer of the U.S. International Trade Administration. And Eric Mill, Senior Advisor, Technology Transformation Service at the General Services Administration. And it's good to have you all here today. And we're talking about jump-starting modernization in government. And it's often the conversations center around hardware and servers and clouds and so forth. But really, the purpose of all that is to run software. That's why all that exists. So we're going to try to concentrate on software and code, and it can get pretty deep when it comes to modernizing. So I guess we should start with a survey of federal modernizing with respect to applications uh, and where it looks right now, and then we'll delve in from there. And Joe, I think I'm going to start with you. Well, speaking just for the International Trade Administration, we're about 70 to 80 percent through the process of getting rid of all of our legacy code. Um, I don't think we'll have any more old government kind of systems hanging around uh, somewhere in the middle to the end of next year. And how, how did you do that? I mean, what were the challenges there? So uh, for us, uh, the, the challenges are not technical at all. Um, they're actually just getting the business to adopt industry best practices. And by getting them to use industry best practices, we're allowed to use just commercial off-the-shelf software as a service applications. So we don't code anything anymore. I have a no code rule. So we've done our transformation without writing code and my folks aren't allowed to write code and we're gonna keep it that way. So that's kind of it for us. So you just retired those applications and that code rather than try to, but I guess the question then is, knowing what some of the legacy systems had to do, did you try to replicate the logic in them uh, with someone else, or did you just go to whole new applications? No, we tried to copy industry best practices. So part of the problem in government, right, the, the real root of the challenge to modernizing government IT is the challenge of modernizing government. For years and years, decades and decades, um, civil servants, government executives have written regulations and then gotten people to approve them. So then they come back five years later and they say, the reason we have to do all this this special way, the reason we can't do everything the way industry does is because we have all these regulations. Well, those are the guys who wrote the regulations in the first place, right? So, so part of it is just getting rid of all these stupid rules, right? Rules that add no value, but drive you to try to implement business processes that make no sense. If you're willing to just throw out kind of the, the silly regulations and just say, okay, 50, 60, 70 percent of what government does, someone in industry does a similar or the same thing and probably does it more efficiently, more effectively. So let's just adopt the government, the industry best practice, make government operate like a business. And when you get that through to people, then the software decision becomes easy. You just use whatever the Gartner Magic Quadrant leader is for the SaaS, best SaaS application for that thing, whether it's financial, statistics, CRM, or whatever, right? You just go commercial SaaS and follow the same kind of industry best practices that the Fortune 500 do. All right, uh, Eric, GSA you know, leads the way, offers the products and services to help agencies get to that modernizing state. What are you trying to get agencies to do with respect to their software these days? Sure, uh, I mean the, the major thing that we focus on in our work and in, in what we try to empower other agencies to do is agility, automation, and transparency and sharing. Right? It is, uh, speed is a security property, uh, your ability to respond is a security property. You know, if you want to be able to, for example, patch critical vulnerabilities in 30 days, then hopefully you are deploying your software regularly more than, or less than 30 days on a regular basis, right? But when you look at the kind of legacy systems that folks have in place, 
um, or or the the new what the systems that we're building now that will be legacy in five or ten years. Um, you know that is sometimes hard uh, for agencies to do. There's a lot of muscle memory around things like change review boards. Um, there's a lot of instinctive reliance on having humans in the loop uh, for for having you know humans sign off on each step along the way. Um, and the biggest thing that we can really try to offer and that we can try to model are systems that are premised on automation and uh, and taking advantage of automation. So you know as an example. One of the, the products that we've been developing is cloud.gov. It is a platform as a service uh, cloud platform. It's based on the open source cloud foundry. Um, we provide that as a self-service operation, right? So you, you can get a sandbox account with your .gov email without ever talking to us and actually deploy stuff. Uh, and then if you want to go to production, you, know, the, you will talk to us once to pay us. And then after that, you'll never talk to us again, hopefully. Right? You will self-serve and you will automate things along the way. And that is, I think, a foundational property of IT modernization generally, because your ability to respond to threats, your ability to be flexible and to avoid getting getting yourself trapped uh, in your own legacy, you're making new legacy systems, uh, and your ability just to modularize your world that you have around you is all premised on your ability to, to make changes to the, to the environment that you made for yourself. Got it, so the idea is not to build in such rigid systems that were hard coded like we did agencies did in earlier decades uh, exactly and I mean it's it, and I don't want to try to overstate how simple that is because in fact you know there is a different kind of complexity that can be introduced by automation uh, and and but that that complexity is seems far worth uh, far worth taking on because the payoff for that is is long term the payoff for that is multi-level um, and the payoff for that is ultimately you know sleeping a lot better at night with your choices Okay, uh, let's go to Doug uh, from PEGA. What do you see across government? I mean, what are the issues that you see them dealing with? Yeah, it's exactly what Joe and Eric were talking about, about agility and automation. But I think ultimately what the evolution over the past few decades has been is from individual systems, individual applications, to really an understanding that a program and an agency, a department has an overarching mission that needs to be fulfilled. So it's really um, increasingly about driving outcomes. So when we look at individual legacy systems, some might be 30, 40 years old, some might be five years old, but if they're not part of um, a cohesive layer, uh, uh, an understanding of how to drive outcomes for that program and that agency's mission, then they're, they're fractured. They're not considered part of um, the kind of core infrastructure. So really what we see uh, globally with, with governments and especially here in Washington is this um, understanding that these new set of tools, platforms, um, SaaS offerings can, can really kind of bridge all these different systems and um, empower those outcomes. Yeah, so in other words, you start with your outcome as the objective as opposed to some transactional process as your as your goal. That's exactly right. And what, what Joe was talking about and a lot of the work that's happening at the GSA that Eric was referencing is really in support of that transformation. A lot of the change that's happening in government right now is really about understanding why we're there, what is that mission, and how do we then best fulfill it. Um, I, you know, what we saw in the, the 80s and 90s was really about let's build an application that fulfills this piece of the process. But as you start putting all the applications and the processes on the table, you realize you have this entire inventory of stuff. And at the end of the day, you really need to just fulfill missions. And part of what is pressuring government to do this faster, you know, we was talking about low code and no code, and let's um, really kind of look at the, the inventory of things that we have and figure out where do things fit. It's this desire to um, keep up with expectations, and that would be both the public, but also really our internal stakeholders. How do we get work done faster? How do we make um, people calling us, people emailing, chatting with us? How do we make that faster? And how do we actually show the executive and the legislative stakeholders that we're being great stewards of the money? Okay. Um, so maybe let's go back to the International Trade, uh, I almost said Association, <laughs> Administration, uh, and uh, give us an example maybe of, of an outcome where you would then back up to what it is you need in terms of application and processing relate so that the outcome that you wish is what happens. 
Yeah, so, so for us, it's very easy, right? It, we are extremely focused on creating sustaining jobs in the United States of America by promoting fair and equitable trade and enforcing trade rules where country, other countries don't play fair, right? And so, uh, so every day when I wake up and go to work, there's no, there's no question in my mind why I'm going or what we're trying to achieve. And what we've seen happen over the course of the last 30 or 40 years, for whatever reason, is more and more U.S. companies, exponentially more U.S. companies, have been impacted by competition from abroad. So it was okay to have a, a sleepy, little, sleepy little agency that hardly anyone heard of 30 years ago um, because you were servicing 10,000 or 20,000 companies a year. We today need to service hundreds of thousands of U.S. companies a year, right? And, and you can't get there with like the old-fashioned consulting, accounting, legal firm model, right? Mm -hmm. To be sure, our people are our greatest asset, and there's always going to be things that require that human touch, and there are always going to be, you're never going to sell a nuclear power plant on, you know, eBay. Right, so so there are there are these big projects. Right, there are big projects that always require people on the ground, and plus they're the source of all our intel. But for us, it's really if you're going to serve thirty thousand companies a year with this high touch service, how do you serve another three hundred thousand or five hundred thousand companies without adding headcount? Right. And so that's what for us has really been the measure is how do we provide service to more companies to this growing base of, of U.S. companies that need this support um, because other countries don't play fair, right? And unilateral disarmament doesn't work in the world of economics any more than it does in the military, right? And so, so that's kind of where we started, right? How do we help more U.S. companies fight back? And, and so then from there, you just back into, okay, you have customer journeys for different types of customers that need different help, and you have to build a web presence that supports that and build business processes that support that. that that's kind of how we do it. Yeah, I guess that gets to the whole idea, uh, Eric, of the uh, digital services where, I hate to use a cliche, but mass customizing for people if you have 300,000 constituents, or in the case of some other agencies, 3 million or 300 million, uh, simply providing information at a website is no longer adequate for what it is people seek from a, from a federal organization. So how does this translate to the applications you have and the code you have and the data that you have generated by maybe all of those applications such that you can offer these kinds of digital seemingly like they're helping me personally services even though it's on a mass scale and there isn't an individual say at the ITA helping that individual small company. Well, well that's right. So I mean there's there is still a lot of mission driven uh, work in the US government and federal agencies you know that that COTS off the shelf software is, is not going to just solve for you out, out of the gate, right? There's still there's work to be done. Um, you know, uh, maybe one of the examples is uh, as we work with the Federal Election Commission, um, and we've we both talked publicly about the work that we've done taking how they distribute campaign finance information, uh, and we've we've worked with them in deep partnership for several years now um, to to actually create something new, and that is we, so we we write a lot of code, um, but a big part of that is about transfer, right? So. It's not just about building it and kind of throwing it over the wall, right? The when we when we build something, then we we need to go the extra mile to really transfer that, make sure it lands with the agency, make sure that they are able to actually operate that themselves, that they have both the talent, the the skills and the culture and the policies necessary to support that sort of work. Um, we can't become a crutch uh, for them, uh, and then. We also, I mean, software is written for, for many more reasons than just you know, developing a new thing from scratch and then running it, right? So uh, we have uh, an acquisition team at GSA and, and the Technology Transformation Service that has cross-functional teams that include engineers during our work helping people buy things and helping them manage the contract mm -hmm. and helping them see success, All right? So an example of that is our work with, with the new Equip system. Um, that, Work for has to happen somewhere. Uh, that's right. Yeah, um, and with and with DoD, who's also running their infrastructure. Um, 
So that is, that's work that has to happen somewhere, right? Somebody has to write that software, um, and there's always going to be a mix of people involved. You can't solve problems with a, a crack team of great engineers. You have multiple parties that are all working in concert to build something new to start and then to maintain it along the way. And the same principles apply to that that apply to all, all kinds of work with technology. You make sure you build in agility, making sure that you're prioritizing reuse and sharing with people so that you're not siloing information or software, um, and you know, fundamentally making this, breaking down enough barriers where you don't have people's roles rigidly defined, right? Like the, it's not just the people whose title is software engineer or who are GS 2210s that are that, that have some inkling of how the software works and some ability to to modify it and react to it and oversee it. Um, so yeah, it's, you mentioned that you want to make sure that agencies to which you send software that might have been coded under under a con, you know under having help from GSA, right. say maybe 18F or something like sure. that. You said uh, that they have to, you want to make sure that they have the skills and ability to mm -hmm. do that kind of work. What did you mean specifically? To maintain the code? To maintain to it and continue developing it, right? I mean, whether that's through FTEs or through contract support, um, you know, that's something where uh, you, the, the agency, you know, will will need to be able to run that. And that's that's not something that's handled just at the very, very tail end as an afterthought, right? Like that's. You know, that is a working partnership the entire way through um, with people very aware of, of what has to happen and where this is going. So Joe, you don't code, but you acquire code. How does that ring for you? GSA and I tend to differ in opinions on the edges a little, right? So I, I fully respect and appreciate the work GSA does in trying to make people share things that they've implemented or developed across the government. Um, and to be more agile and to move forward. But like, I think the idea of GSA running a government data center for unclassified systems is, is a misuse of government funds, right? Quite, quite frankly, I think we have Amazon, we have Azure. So I think there's a fundamental decision that we haven't really had the full discussion about yet in the government IT community. It's do we believe that government should only fill in the gaps where the industry has, has a hole or do we think that the government just does stuff in competition with industry? And I, I happen to believe that anywhere there's a industry provider, the government should not do it. So does that mean GSA should never run a data center? Well, of course, there are some things that make sense for the government to do, and it may make sense for the government to have a data center somewhere, and it certainly makes sense to have it shared. Um, but but I, I just, it's a slippery slope because, because the problem we have in government is the way people are rewarded. They're rewarded for growing programs. And, and that's insane to me, right? When I'm in my private business, then yeah, I mean, my, I, I've said this earlier, right? My resume reads, I grew this company from 3 million to 40 million. I grew this company from 7 million to 20 million. I want the government part of my resume to read, I took this IT budget from 60 million to 30 million, right? The goal of every government executive should be to shrink their program. And, and so I think the, the, the problem with sometimes the way we approach these things is we reward people for growing programs. And, and, and I just think there are very few apps that need to be written by the government or by government contractors in Java. Right, like, or in C plus plus, right? I think there are. I think the next generation, and part of this goes to where the technology is. So, if you look at the definition of platform as a service and the definition of software as a service, I would say they're both changing and merging to what I would. You know, you could call it platform as a service 2.0 or software as a service 2.0. But if you look at where the industry is headed, it's headed towards this. SaaS platform that is a low code, no code platform where I can build apps. And, and I think sure. GSA is perfectly situated to help people develop apps in these low code, no code commercial SaaS environments and then share them across the government, right? So that we're not building the same task and tracking system, you know, in Microsoft or in Pega or in Salesforce 15 different times or 100 different times. but but the idea of where I think you cross a line is when someone says, I'm going to build a task tracking system in Java and then put it on servers, right? I think that's crazy. All right, well, we've got a lot more to discuss here. I can see that, uh, but we're going to take a short break right now. Our discussion is Jumpstarting IT Modernization in Government, sponsored by PEGA, here on Federal News Radio 1500 AM and federalnewsradio.com.